Hi, Creative Cutie. Have you ever considered that your love for and belief in yourself might be the secret sauce to unlocking your full creative potential and achieving holistic success? I recently found out or figured out or came to believe that our success is really 80% being and only about 20% doing. So today I want to discuss with you one-on-one the profound impacts of self-love, spiritual connection, community, and personal dreams on this creative journey. Welcome to Unleash Your Inner Creative with Lauren LaGrasso. I'm Lauren LaGrasso, your host. I'm a singer-songwriter, podcaster, producer, public speaker, and creative coach. And this show is meant to give you tools to love, trust, and know yourself enough to claim your right to creativity and go after whatever it is that's on your heart. And today, I want to talk with you about holistic success. The ways I've been reframing success lately and also just things I've been thinking about when it comes to what I want to work on in life and what I think the collective is shifting into in order to get to the next step in humanity. Today, the day I'm recording, which is Saturday, January 20th, Pluto entered Aquarius. And I don't know a ton about what that means, but I do know it's a huge shift in the consciousness and it's going to be shaking things up a lot. Pluto before had been in Capricorn, which is very, it's an earth sign. It's very grounded in reality. A plus B equals C. Aquarius is about doing everything new, everything different, shaking up old systems. It's called the humanitarian of the Zodiac for a reason. It's about the people rising up and reclaiming their power, individuality. And so I do really believe with this next phase of the world consciousness, it's our job to really figure out how to love, trust, and know ourselves, and then how to love, trust, and know others and make change from that place versus how do I get the most money? How do I have the most success? You know, It's more like, Can I create a foundation that actually makes sense to build something real upon? So that's what we'll be discussing today. And I came to this because, you know, I've been doing a lot of self-development work. I've been, obviously, you know, I've been doing therapy for a long time. I've been taking classes with this woman named Victoria Song, who literally, you've heard her on the podcast, but she literally coached, she coaches billionaires, but she doesn't do it from the point of view of, you need to do these five business tactics and then you will succeed. She really does it from the point of view of healing. So we're very aligned in that way. And she's the one that said to me in one of the classes, success is 80 to 85% being and 15 to 20% doing. So it's really about changing your internal systems. And then yes, you have to do the tactics, but it's more about changing what's going on internally to believe that we actually deserve the things that we desire. So this has gotten me thinking a lot about self-love and my journey as a creative and the problems I've come up against and where I'm at today. And I guess one of the main things I'm really thinking about right now is how I used to be mad at God. And I want to clarify, when I say God, God for me, which it's probably different for you, is eternal love. It's the source that we all come from and the source that we will all return to. I don't think of God as a big man in the sky. I think of God as deep, deep love and knowing and a higher, like the most profound wisdom you can ever think of. And I used to be really mad at God, though. I used to cry when something would go wrong in my creative career. I'd throw myself on the ground, pounding the ground, screaming, crying, asking, God, do you even love me? Why would you put these dreams in my heart if you don't want me to have them? And and very recently, and I'm not saying I'm never going to do this again. Listen, I'm human. If I was perfect, I'd be ascending right now. But I at least right now have the intellectual knowing and it's moving into my body and soul knowing that um, that's not true. And that was, that was a very small way of thinking. The reason I'm thinking about it like this is something I've been kind of gnawing on. You've heard me on my solo episodes going about this for the last couple, probably last year and a half, last couple of years is if you're coming at it from the perspective of, I have to get this because if I don't get this, I will not be good enough. You will, if you get the thing, get the thing and then still be unhappy. 
However, if you're coming at it from a platform of solid self-love and self-worth and you just want to get the thing to create impact, to feel more like yourself, to share a message with the world, you have a very good chance of getting the thing and still feeling good. And regardless of the reception, feeling good because you did whatever it is that you want to do. And so I had that knowing. But then a deeper knowing clicked into place recently as I've been doing this self-development work and reflecting and doing therapy and journaling. And that is, I used to ask, God, why, why are you making my journey so long? If you don't want me to have these things, wouldn't you just let me know? Why are you putting this longing in my heart if you don't want me to ever have it? And since I've been doing this work, my perspective has flipped to God loves me so much that God was not going to allow me to get the thing from a hollow place. That maybe there are some people that for whatever reason, their journey is to get it and then have to do the work. But my journey is to do the work and then start achieving my dreams. Because I'm the kind of person that if I had reached the dream without feeling this solid platform of self-love backing me up, I would have crumbled. And I did go through pain and suffering and overworking and, and you know doing things for people that wasn't paid back. But I was lucky enough to do it in areas that weren't my deepest dream. And so, yeah, it's a perspective shift from what if it's not that God doesn't love you enough? What if God and life and the universe love you so deeply that they are only going to allow you to get to your dream from a place of self-worth and self-love so that when you arrive, when you arrive there, you will be ready and you will be able to actually appreciate it because you know it's coming from the truest part of who you are. It's just a different frame of view. And to me, if you consider yourself a late bloomer or you feel like your journey is taking too long, that perspective shift kind of changes everything. What if it's taking so long because the universe actually loves you and wants you to be able to get there from a place that is authentic to you instead of from a place that is yearning for someone else's approval? I think that's my truth. (laughs) I think that's the key to unleashing creatively is finding healing in the places of us that are searching for worth in the outcome of our work. If you think about your dreams in general, I was talking about this with my boyfriend, Timmy, you know, why do dreams form in the first place? I think there's a couple parts or a couple ways that they can happen. One, you do something and you feel so free. You feel like a tingly feeling in your body. You feel like you're in the exact right place in the universe and like all, like time stops and you just feel good. It just, it feels like a homecoming, the thing that you do that then becomes your dream. Okay. There's that piece. And there can also be, and I would say for probably most of us, there's a piece where when you did that thing, you got recognition you got acceptance, you got applause for many of us that are performers, you got pride from your family. And so sometimes when we're younger or younger in our journey to self-love, that peace becomes so overemphasized, you end up going for something that maybe isn't even the purest vision of what you want. You end up going for something that other people have kind of put on you instead of what's coming from inside of you. And it's natural. Like we all want to be socially accepted and applauded for our work. We're not going to say like that piece has to go away because it's, it's normal and natural to have that piece be part of our desire. But if it's so overemphasized, like if that's the 90% and the 10% only is like, because it makes you feel good. Like if you would be so much more miserable doing your creative exploit alone versus like in front of an audience and getting the acclaim for it, then it's time to bring it back to center, bring it back to you, bring it back to how does this make me feel in my body? Is it still accurate for me? Do I need to reconfigure this and and 
pick a slightly different path. Yeah. If it's so much in the camp of what other people want for you or have given you praise for, it's time to bring it back into what is true for me outside of any outward impetus. Another thing I've realized through this deeper self-love work. And I hope I'm making sense. I also have to say that every single solo podcast, because it literally sounds like alien speak, everything I'm saying, but I hope I'm making sense. But another thing I've been thinking about from this self-love work is when you are so deep into the camp of needing approval from other people in order to prove to yourself that you're a worthwhile human being and you deserve to take up space here on earth, you can get into really, really bad situations. So I've been kind of observing my life from the point of view of healing. And it was really fascinating. In this class with Victoria Song, she literally had you make a list. Think of how hard this was. I My brain almost exploded when I had to do it. She had me make a list of every time somebody had made me feel like I wasn't deserving. Every time somebody made me feel bad about myself. And to take an inventory of your entire life. I mean, there's things that you don't even realize are still upsetting you that come up when you have to do a full timeline from birth until whatever age you are. And I noticed a pattern in that list. And you don't have to get so in depth. I went crazy about it because I'm like, oh my God, I have to think of everything. I just like, I take things really literally sometimes is something I'm learning about myself. But the benchmark moments of times when people made me not feel good about myself and like I wasn't enough for just who I was, a lot of them had to do with me being in contact with someone, whether it was a teacher, whether it was a friend, whether it was an employer, a past lover, a family member, which I want to be clear, was never my parents, but a family member, whoever it was that I have throughout my history been in proximity to and interacting with people who did not treat me right, who at best were dismissive and at worst were actually toxic and abusive verbally and mentally and emotionally. And with many of those people, both in my childhood and my adulthood, not only did I feel like I couldn't stand up for myself to them and like I was powerless with them, I also felt like I had to cover up for the fact that they were behaving badly and protect them. And so I've healed a lot from that. And it's been years since I've been in a situation like that where I was like protecting somebody who was objectively abusive to me. But through this self-love course, I've realized something and that is there is never a room that I ever have to go in again where nobody will stand up for me because I can always stand up for myself. And I never again have to protect somebody or pretend like it's not happening, that somebody is being cruel to me or mistreating me. I have no problem doing it for other people. And I have many times stood up for other people in ways that negatively affected me with such abusive people. But for some reason, doing it for myself felt impossible. And I, I don't have to protect people who don't treat me right anymore. Not only do I not have to protect them, I never have to be around them. I can speak up to them and then I can get away from them. This is another piece of the self-love journey. I've really realized this. Take this into account in all your relationships, friendships, lovers, otherwise. If loving somebody else requires you to stop loving yourself, then that relationship is not a place for you to exist. If to love somebody else, you have to abandon yourself, you have to silence pieces of yourself, you have to cut yourself off from your own needs, it's not a place for you to exist. And this has been revolutionary for me because it's helped me also like depersonalize a lot of these people that I was in toxic cycles with because I look at those situations and I was like, oh, that was just a situation where for me to be in relationship with them, I had to let myself go. I had to abandon myself. And this is just the indicator for me. If that ever starts to happen, if I ever even see the seeds of that again, you better believe I'm out that door. 
if I think that there's some sort of hope, I can try to work on it with that person. But usually a person that requires you to abandon yourself in order to be in community with them is not a person that's going to be like, oh, yeah, let me just take a look at myself and change. <laughs> Like if they had that capacity to, they probably never would have put you in that deep of a situation anymore. And this isn't talking about like my boyfriend likes it, you know, likes the air conditioning on at 68 and I like it on at 72. I mean, this is talking about like deep stuff. Like in order for me to be in relationship with you, I can't say how I feel because otherwise you will punish me. So if you are finding that going on in any of your relationships, and by the way, that happens in work a lot. So definitely keep an eye out there. But if you're finding that to be true in any of your relationships, that is not a place for you. That is not a room for you. True love, true friendship, true community would never require you to abandon yourself in order to be in that room. Something that really has helped me remember this fact as I enter different rooms and some, and I mean, I work in Hollywood, there's going to be people who are not healthy. <laughs> Unfortunately, I want to be part of the solution to that. But as I have to enter rooms with all different kinds of people, something that has helped me remember that I always have the ability to stand up for myself is instead of just thinking of it as me, I think of the little me. The first time I felt something like this, you know, I was like three. And I think of her standing beside me or like sitting in the corner, so scared. And I just want to protect her because she deserves better. And so do I. So sometimes if I can't access that for myself in this moment, I think of the little me and I put her behind me and I just say enough, you know, kind of energetically. And then I'll stand up for her and me together to whoever is serving me a platter of bullshit. But that seems to really help. And that is another self-love realization I've had in the past two, three weeks is that, you know, I, I talked about this on my social media, but I was doing some organizing. I've been really enjoying organizing and kind of getting to the bottom of a lot of my clutter this year. It's been hugely helpful. But I was organizing and I was organizing books and books I just find excruciating to like throw away or give away. But I was, you know, making some good headway. I probably tossed like a dozen books. And sorry to book lovers out there. I know that's brutal. It's brutal for me too because I'm like, that's somebody's work. But I, I gave them away. So hopefully somebody gets some. But um, I was going through and then I came upon a huge stack of journals. And I was looking at one and I'm like, could I throw this away? I thought that for a minute. And I was like, No. I could never even consider throwing that away because that journal contains my life from when I was a younger girl. It was like, maybe it was five or 10 years ago that I'd been writing in this journal. And the thought of throwing that girl away, of throwing away her thoughts, of throwing away her concerns, of throwing away her desires, like I could never even consider it. And I thought, wow, I have so much compassion and so much love for that younger version of myself. But for some reason, it feels so unbelievably difficult to feel that for myself right now. Like I do one thing wrong and the first thing I want to do is just beat myself up and tell myself how terrible I am and how everybody has it more together in the whole world but me. And then I thought, but I don't feel that way about that younger version. And I remember that younger version felt that way about herself. And I thought, well, you know what? If I feel so much compassion and so much love for myself five, 10 years ago, and of course younger, what if I could just draw the, the love that I feel for that younger version into this current timeline and feel it for myself now? Because I know I'm going to feel it for myself in five, 10 years. Why wait? Why not now? Why can't I be nice to myself now? And the answer is I can. And so I encourage you, if you have any tender feelings for any younger version of who you are, yes, hold that sweet younger self with so much love and compassion. And I want you to picture putting your hand on that younger version of yourself, feeling all the love you're giving to her, 
Then pull that hand into this current timeline, put it on your heart, and give that to yourself right now. Because you're going to do it eventually. So why wait to be self-loving? Here's another thing. When you really start to love yourself, you'll kind of notice how you've been fighting for scraps maybe in this form of the world where you weren't loving yourself or seeing yourself for all that you are. And you've been fighting for scraps, table scraps, but maybe you really want the tomahawk steak or the whole cow. Tomahawk steaks are huge for those that don't know. I mean, like they're the size of my torso. So yeah, I think because I've been so externally motivated, a lot of this creative journey, just trying to prove that I was enough, that I belong, that I was a good enough singer, that I was a good enough podcaster, that I was a good enough producer, whatever it was. And I was trying so hard to get other people to see that and validate that. I wasn't seeing myself and seeing my own potential and believing in my own work. And so anytime somebody would give me a compliment or tell me I was good enough, it was like somebody that had been in the desert, thirsty, dying of thirst and in need of water. And just like, yes, like I'll take the drop because I was dying for any worth. It didn't matter where it came from. And we do need other people to believe in us. Don't get me wrong. We need it. Without people on our side, and I'm going to get to that, the love and support of others. That's hugely important. We need that. But there's a difference between knowing you need community, knowing you need, as Julia Cameron calls them, believing mirrors, knowing you need the support of your friends and family and mentors, and desperately searching for it from anywhere you can get it. Because also the thing is, like, If you're dying of thirst, you don't care where the water source or liquid source comes from. You might drink from a poisoned river and you wouldn't stop to think about it because you just need the liquid. You're going to drink without thinking if you're dying of thirst. And I think that the same thing is true with our own journey for self-worth. Like if you're dying for worth, if you're empty of yourself, you will take that worth wherever you can get it, regardless if the source is poisonous, which is how we end up in these situations with people who require us to abandon ourselves in order to be in relationship with them. So don't fight for scraps. Build that platform of self-love, self-worth, self all the good things, <laughs> compassion, and start to realize if you want the tomahawk steak, you can get it. You don't have to fight for the scraps. Moving on to um, love and support from other people. So something else that I've been doing recently is working with a strategist. She is amazing. Her name is Stacy, and I'll be posting and sharing about her eventually, I'm sure. But It's the first time in a long time, maybe ever in my professional career, where I feel like I have somebody who truly has my back and is not going to force me to go it alone. Like I've had a lot of people who have seen me and been like, oh yeah, that's good. Okay. Like do this, this, and that, and that's nice, but not really walked with me. There's such a difference between somebody who like basically like barks ideas at you, but won't walk with you or help you hold any of the weight of those ideas and the path that you're on. And somebody who sees you, shares ideas with you and helps you execute them and bring them to the finish line. It's not somebody that you're mentoring who's like less seasoned than you. It's someone who's as seasoned as you or more seasoned than you and who's really going to walk with you, hold your hand, reflect back to you, give you ideas, help you execute the ideas. Like I've never had somebody do that, not fully. I've had people who were like, wow, you're really good. Or I see this one part of you and I'm going to help this one part of you, especially if it benefits me. But I've never had somebody who just asked me like, what is your dream? Okay, let's figure out the best way to get there. And she's also helping me figure out how to bring so many of my dreams underneath one roof. I've been saying for a long time, I love singing. I love songwriting. I love podcasting. I love producing. I love hosting. I love coaching. I love 
speaking. And I wonder if there is a way to do more of these things concurrently. So I'm not so exhausted, especially, and I'm going to get to this after this section, but when I'm thinking about what my personal dreams are, you know, I want to have a child. I can't be working from 8am until 8, 9, 10 PM every night. It's just, it's not sustainable for that. And also like, it's not enjoyable anymore. Like it was fine before I had a personal life and you know, would only really like see people on the weekends and I would work all day and all night every day during the week, especially it was fine during the pandemic, but that's just not feasible. So I'm really trying to design my whole life with Stacey right now. And it feels really good just to have that support. And so if you're somebody who like me has never had the full support of somebody else who not only would like give you an idea or say like you're good in passing or help you achieve something that served their own purposes. If you've never had somebody who really supported you from like a pure point of view, either start looking for a mentor who will help you pick up the weight and walk with you. Or if you have the means, look for a coach or a strategist who will help you see you create plans with you and then help you execute the plans because that's the piece that's missing so much of the time is the, here's the idea, but then there's no follow through in the execution. And that's where so many of us get lost because we feel alone. We feel like the weight's too heavy to carry. We feel like we don't know what to do next. So that's really been amazing. And then I guess what I want to call into my life next is more people like that. Like I would love to have a manager or an agent that can help me in that way that really believes in me. And it's not just like, okay, yeah, I'll sign you. What can you do for me? It's like, okay, I'll sign you. And then I'm going to work with you to build your career. Yeah. It feels so different. It's like someone took a brick out of my chest and I wish that for you. (laughs) And then here's a second piece I've been thinking about a lot lately. Having community on a creative journey makes all the difference. So when I think about the times I've been happiest in my creative life, it's been honestly like in high school when I was in the theater department and like we were all doing it together in college when I was in the theater department and we were all doing it together. And then when I first moved to LA and I was like really deep in the acting world, but I was taking acting classes with like people I loved And I think the reason for that is like, it was a clear community. I felt held. We were all kind of having like similar experiences and could help each other and, and get together and go out and talk about what our journey has been like in acting. And, um, you know, I've had tastes of that. I've been like sort of in the music community out here. I've been in the podcasting community, definitely, but like, I don't have a place to go. It's not like I have like a podcast meeting on Wednesdays. So One thing I really want to be more intentional about in 2024 is building community. I'd like to build some community. Like I'd like to make this show more of a community. The people that I know that listen to this show are just the best people in the world. They're people who are going after their dreams from a place of self-development. Like, do you know how rare that is? At least right now it's rare. And I believe people like you who are really working to go after your dreams from this holistic point of view and not just dreams, but your whole life. Like our social justice movements right now are so polarized. And so you're bad. No, you're bad. There's no way we're going to make progress by shaming people. And I'm going on a tangent right now, but everything in the whole world needs to be looked at from a holistic point of view, from a loving point of view. That is the only way that we're going to make change in any area. Like it all has to come from love, from curiosity, from compassion, from empathy. No sustainable change is made through violence. I really believe. Well, change is made through violence, but no positive change. And no sustainable positive change is made through shaming yourself. So anyway, how did I even get on that? Oh yeah. Just like we need community as much as I'm talking about. Yes. Love yourself, all this stuff. Great. But we can't fully do anything alone. And so, you know, really what made me realize this was when Timmy and I were home over the holidays and 
work felt so much easier because I knew my parents' love was there. Also, like we had help. Like my mom was making us lunch. I I knew like if something went wrong technologically, Tim was there. My dad was there. My mom was there. Like they would help me through it. There were just so many reasons why that part of life is easier. Also, interestingly enough, like Tim and my relationship, it's always beautiful, but it was just so much more beautiful because we had that net of love around us between my family, like my immediate family, mom and dad, my aunts and uncles, Timmy's brother came in. We just felt held in a way that right now in LA, so many of my friends, I'm not kidding you, like 60 to 70% of my friends have left Los Angeles since 2020. So I'm on the hunt. If you know anyone cool and you want to set me up on a friendship date. I mean, I still have lots of great friends here, but I don't just want friends. I want community. And I've always kind of been more of a, I'm terrified of like cults and group think. So I've always been more of a person that's like, I'd rather have individual friends because I think there's issues in groups. It's just true. It takes a more skillful approach than if it's just a one-on-one relationship. But that said, like, I think I'm done with that. I've evolved enough to be able to handle myself in group situations. And it's not like I've never been in a group. It's just like with friendships, I've always liked smaller groups of friendships, two to four people versus like a group of 15. But I I really do think I'm craving community in this deeper way. And I know the reason is because it makes all of life softer to have a place to land and a place where you know you're loved and accepted and can ask for help and offer help and where you have common goals. And so, yeah, I'm really looking for community in my creativity, but just in life in general and to build family out here because it makes life so much better. Which brings me to my next point on this holistic success journey. While you're building your career dreams, you got to make sure you're also building your life dreams. So something I did up until pretty much the time I was like 30, 31, was I only from 22 to 31, I only really focused on my career. I remember I would literally, my dad would be like, he would win trips through work and he invite me to a trip in let's say August and it was March and he'd be like, Lauren, do you want to go on this trip with me? I'm like, dad, I could be doing anything at that time. I can't commit to a trip. I would hold myself back from life and from things I really wanted in life because I was so committed to my career. And I've talked about this a lot on the pod, but You can't just focus on one area of your life and then think that the other area is going to fall into your lap. And this is something that I was really inspired by through working with Stacy, who's my strategist. But she, when she takes in your intake, she asks you not only what your wildest dreams would be for your career, but also what are your wildest dreams for your life? What do you want your life to look like? How many kids do you want? Where do you want to live? And she takes all of this into account in making your strategy for like what your career will be because one hand washes the other. Like we can't be consciously building a career without also consciously building a life. And so if you're someone who like me, like I'm naturally geared, I don't know if it's natural, but like I have been in the past geared to be, which is really, really, really focused on career. I highly recommend, or whatever it is that you're hyper focused on, where if you stop being intentional, your your attention seems to be drawn back there. Look at the other things you really want in your life and see if you can't balance it out a little bit and start creating movement toward those other things you want too. So for me, like I really love travel. Since I've met Tim, it's really been a very important part of my life. Never prioritized that in the past. I didn't even know you could take two weeks off. I thought that that was impossible, but the company I work for has a flexible vacation policy, which means you can take as much vacation as you want, as long as it's cool with your manager and the other people you're working with. So it's like, if you have the opportunity, take it. Like, don't just work yourself into the ground. Do you want a relationship? Do you want kids? What's your ideal living situation? Like, do you want to live in a house? Are you happy in the city you're in? Like, we need to not just take inventory of our career and all the things we want to kill it in in our career. We need to take inventory of our personal lives and ask, like, am I having enough fun? That's been a constant battle for me these past few years. Like, fun is my favorite thing. Connection and fun are my favorite things in life. 
And honestly, like these past few years, I just haven't made enough time for fun and for joy. And so when those moments happen, it's so precious. But one thing I want to do in this next year is getting more intentional about fun. Like it's my dream to laugh. (laughs) See, I'm making it come true. I love that quote by Cheryl Strayed. Don't let your dreams ruin your life because your life is still your life. And you have to have a great life because if you don't have a rich life to draw from, you've got nothing to create from. If you're just constantly in the grindstone, there's no inspiration to draw from from the outside world. You have to prioritize your personal life and your personal dreams. Write them down. Know what they are. Know what you're shooting for. Look at your your personal dreams next to your career dreams and say, do these line up? And if not, how can I get them to connect? So I just think it's really important as we're creating these dreams for our career and our creativity to also look at what are my dreams for my life and how can these all fit into the same world? And if they can't, what do I need to rearrange? What are my priorities? What are my values? What makes most sense to be in my life? Which brings me to be flexible and open to the fact that your dreams might change shape. Be open to surprises instead of being so rigid. Sometimes when we're on a certain path, we just think, I have to finish this path no matter what. And if I don't go down this path, then I won't be me. And all the other things I've done won't have been for anything. That's almost never true. Everything is always leading into everything else. It's all connected. It's all part of your journey. And so I've been kind of going through this lately with music. I'm like, what do I really want music to be in my life? I mean, one thing that I found in this past year is writing children's music has been huge. I haven't gotten to release any of it yet. I'm so excited for you to hear it when it does come out. It's been the greatest joy, but it's allowed me to drop so much of my perfectionism, so much of my story around how hard it is to make a song, so much of my story around like, oh, I don't feel good enough as a musician. Because when I tell people about my children's music, they light up like a Christmas tree. And I'm going to tell you why. Because I do. Because I'm excited to tell people about it. And it doesn't matter who I'm telling. Recently at a friend's like housewarming party, I met a woman who worked as a Disney exec. She was just as excited as the rapper that I met at a bar who I told about my kids' music. And the rapper was like, maybe I should get into that too. So when you have a genuine joy and enthusiasm for something, other people get excited about it. It doesn't matter who you're talking to. It doesn't matter what the thing is. It's really made me realize that the energy I had attached to my music was so much more important than the music. I almost felt like I was apologizing for my music every time I told somebody I was a songwriter because it hadn't been like successful in the way I thought it should be. Instead of me thinking about, again, this goes back to the first point, instead of me thinking about how did I feel making it? How do I feel about being a songwriter? How much do I love music? Like, yeah, I fucking love music. Instead of thinking from it from that point of view, I'm like, oh, they're going to look at my Spotify page and see I don't have that many listens. It's like I brought so much baggage from the outside world of what they were telling me my worth should be instead of what it made me feel inside. Instead of me thinking, wow, I unleashed my inner creative and I did it through this music and I'm so proud of myself that I put these songs out and I've got more that I'm putting out and I'm just trying to figure out what to do with them. Yeah. So anyway, all that's to say, Let yourself change your view of what your dreams are. So right now, my dream with music is to figure out how to make it like a solid part of my career to get more ears on my songs and to release this children's music into the world. Like a couple years ago, it might have been like to get 10 million followers on Spotify, but that's not really my dream. Like I just literally want my songs to be heard by more people. That's all I want right now because I love the songs and I believe in them, and I know they can help people. So it's also, it's not just about the dream changing. I just think naturally when you change your internal relationship to whatever your creative exploit is, your dream is going to shift to a place that's more authentic for you and that's more internally driven. And then I think the other thing that has really changed for me is it is still important to me to be a multi-hyphenate, but the most important thing to me is finding a way to be a multi-hyphenate in one household. Like instead of running to all these different houses to take care of my creative babies, 
I want all of them to live in one house and for us to be a beautiful, happy, blended family. (laughs) So yeah, again, I think the more you know yourself, the more you know your goals and, and your limits, the more you can create a life that is authentic to you and create dreams that are authentic to who you are on the inside versus who you're trying to be on the outside. And the final thing I want to discuss today is dry January. So as you know, from the episode I did with Zoe and just from, if you follow me on socials, I've been talking about it. I have been doing dry January after a fairly wet December. (laughs) And, um, you know, I'm not a huge drinker, but I definitely enjoy a glass of wine. I definitely do. It really upticked for me during the pandemic when, I mean, I did not see anyone during the pandemic. I saw my parents and that was it. I was not even ever in a room with anybody else unless they did a COVID test or until the vaccines came out. So, you know, it was a very difficult time because I really do thrive on being with and around other people. And I think during that time, I learned some unhealthy coping mechanisms. There were times when it was more or less, but like, you know, I went through some health stuff in 2021. So eased up then, but you know, I was frequently having like a glass of wine or a couple white claws throughout the week. And even that is a coping mechanism. Like if you're having it to like build community with friends or because you really love the taste of this wine, I think that's a different thing. But when you're using it to escape your feelings of loneliness, anxiety, stress, depression, feelings about your own life of any sort, it is now becoming a coping mechanism. And I don't like that coping mechanism for myself. Like Sure, it can be fun once in a while, but you know, one thing I've been kind of surprised about through the dry January is there've been a couple times like where I really wished I could have a glass of wine and I'm like, "Huh, that's interesting." And so what I did instead was yoga. I had a really bad headache this day, so I did yoga cuz I was so fucking stressed. I was so so stressed. It, I've been really stressed this past couple of weeks, but weirdly also happy. So that's an interesting piece, but I did yoga. I did, um, like a couple meditations and I did this full head massage that was supposed to release a tension headache. At the end, I felt better. I have like a lavender pill that I take, which is just lavender oil that kind of like actually relaxes the system. So after I did all that, I actually felt better from a holistic point of view. Instead of just having a glass of wine, it was like, well, what can I do to actually calm my nervous system instead of temporarily calming it and then tomorrow it flares up again? And I'm not saying like, I'm still gonna have a cocktail sometimes, but it's been, this dry January, it's been really interesting to me in the times when in the past, maybe I would have poured a glass of wine to actually find healthy coping mechanisms. Because life is hard. You're still going to need something to get through. But it's better to reach for yourself than to reach for a substance that doesn't actually address anything. Like all of those things, I would say, maybe not the lavender pill, but everything else was like, reaching inside of me to find an internal coping tool and like reaching to my spiritual connection to God to find an internal and spiritual coping tool instead of something that is material. And so I highly recommend if you haven't ever done a sober period, a period of sobriety to just see like, when do I actually feel like I wish I had the alcohol? Because the other thing I will say that's really interesting is despite being as stressed as I have, I've been feeling really happy. Um, And I do think that's due in part to not drinking and not having it be a part of my life at all. Also, like, I think a big part of the reason why a lot of us drink is honestly because 
we just want something fun and that doesn't feel like a Coca-Cola or seltzer water, which by the way, I love seltzer water. I'm drinking some now. But sometimes you want more than that. And so another thing that I found is like drinking non-alcoholic wine, um, drinking like they have like botanical mocktails, which are kind of fun. They have really delicious mocktails that are like supposed to taste like the alcoholic version, but it's just non-alcoholic with non-alcoholic spirits. Like sometimes you just want something more elevated than a soda. And it's not as deep as like, I'm doing this to escape. It's literally, you just want something that's tasty that makes you feel like you're an adult. So that's also been fun to realize like, oh, okay, you know, when I feel stressed, I can do these three things. And then to treat myself at the end of the night, like I'll let myself have this non-alcoholic gin and tonic and it tastes delicious and refreshing. And then I feel like I've like had a little adult treat and then I go to bed and I feel great in the morning, you know? So anyway, if you are curious to learn more about yourself and more about your relationship with alcohol and more about like what the overall picture of your life looks like, because it will give you a very clear picture of your life, having it be free from any substance, then I highly recommend a dry month to really get back in touch and say, Hey, what's going on in there (laughs) to yourself? (laughs) Anyway, so to wrap it up, I really believe holistic success comes from loving yourself from a place that is really whole and true, from having deep love and support from other people, having community, having somebody in your life who's a mentor and a coach who will walk with you on the path to your dreams, making sure that while you're building your creative dreams, you're also building your life dreams your personal dreams, your dreams for a family, for a relationship, being open to surprises and to the fact that your dreams might change and being in touch with yourself as that comes about and potentially having a a month of some sort of sobriety of removing something in your life that might be a coping mechanism that you're not super happy with and just observing yourself And learning coping mechanisms that come from inside of you and from your spiritual connection. So thank you so much for being on this journey with me, for listening. And I just really appreciate you. And I love you. And by you listening, you're helping my dreams come true. If you do love the show, if it's meant a lot to you, it would mean so much to me if you would take the time to give it a rating and review on Apple Podcasts give it a rating on Spotify. I know podcasters are always saying this. You have no idea the big difference it makes. Not only does it brighten my day and all of our days, but it also really helps us get visibility and climb the charts, which is huge for an indie podcaster. So if you have literally, it takes like two minutes tops to do it. That would mean so much to me. Also make sure that you're following the show. Um, share the show with a friend. Podcasts are spread person to person. It makes such a big difference. Thank you, Liz Full, for the show's theme music. Thank you, Rachel Fulton, for associate producing the show. And I love, trust, and believe in you. And thank you for doing the same with me. Talk with you next week.